Welcome to another episode of Electable. I'm Deb Chubb. And uh, today, oh, and we are sponsored by the Indiana Women's Action Movement. Um, please visit our website, indianawam.org, and uh, see what you can do to help us in our mission uh, to inform the public about interesting and important issues uh, facing uh, Hoosiers. Yeah, today, we have one of the most important issues uh, that we need to talk about. And so with me today is Denise Kipke. She's the um, new executive director at The Caring Place, a domestic violence shelter and services uh, in Porter County in Valparaiso. So um, welcome, Denise. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thanks, Deb. You know, our theme is let's start talking. So I really appreciate you bringing me on to talk about this important issue. Absolutely. And uh, just as a testament to the fact that nobody does, nobody talks about the issue of domestic violence is that I, when I look to see if there were any bills pertaining to domestic violence in the state legislature uh, this session, there were zero, nothing that I could find. Um, yeah. So interesting. Uh, it does seem to be the topic that no one wants to talk about. So we're going to talk is. about it. <laughs> Uh, fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah. Denise, um, I know you're somewhat new in your position, but mm -hmm. um, tell us what's happening in uh, this area uh, that is uh, Porter County and the region um, in terms of domestic violence. What's going on? Sure. Um, I, I am new in this position of president and CEO. I've been here a full year now with The Caring Place, but prior to that, I worked for The Caring Place on the side. So I worked full-time in education. You and I have uh, an education background mm -hmm. in common. And it was just such an important topic that I started working with Caring Place as a volunteer on the side. So I was working full-time in education, joined The Caring Place, um, to help them create a bullying prevention program back in the day. It was called NBA uh, and they had sponsored that. And then when Amanda Bach was killed locally, uh, they called me and asked me to be on a youth dating violence prevention task force. And so I volunteered to do that and then quickly realized we needed a youth task force on dating violence because you know we old folks have no clue what the new dating culture is like. So tell uh, so me about to go. Amanda Bach. I'm not, I'm not familiar with Amanda that. Bach. Amanda Bach was, um, had graduated high school was, and was murdered in a uh, Wheeler area by an ex-boyfriend. So uh, that was about 10 years ago. Now it's, it's been a decade. Um, wonderful young woman. And that's what drew me to uh, volunteer to be on that task force, because as a mother, you know, I have a son, I have a daughter, and um, it was such a horrific awakening to understand that that can happen right here in Porter County, and it can be your child, it could be my child, it can be your neighbor's family. Uh, so I just, I really um, connected with the parents' grief over that as well and wanted to do something. So that's how I started working with The Caring Place. Uh, on youth dating violence prevention. So I became their youth outreach coordinator, uh, created the Amanda Forum, which uh, utilizes a youth leadership kind of peer mentoring uh, sort of strategy to get the word out about dating violence and healthy relationships. You know, we, we can't just keep teaching people what not to do or hounding them to not do things. We have to give people the alternatives. We have to teach people how to have healthy relationships. So that's something in addition to our crisis intervention. You know, as you know, the Caring Place is a 24 hour free emergency crisis center. In addition to that, over the past year, we are really pushing forward, trying to expand our outreach, our prevention and awareness programming, uh, thus the let's start talking. You can't solve an issue, you can't have an impact on an issue if you're not willing to talk about it honestly. So um, um, tell me, like, how are you reaching young people? I mean, I guess I'm a little concerned because I see so much happening at the state legislature that's yeah. limiting education among young yeah. people. And so I'm wondering how are you able to reach young people? So the pandemic has definitely um, made that far more difficult uh, over the past couple of years. 
Prior to the pandemic, we were working with high school youth and created a youth task force um, from across the county, across the region. We would meet monthly and discuss these issues, um, utilize social media to spread the word. We created all sorts of great resources. Um, one of them is breaking up is hard to do. That's our most popular one. You know, that people need to know how to end a relationship respectfully, you know. Uh, and those sorts of things. And all of those resources were created with that youth voice. Then they would go out and work with other teenagers. We did a region-wide conference, you know, full day conference mm -hmm. uh, called Dare to Date Safe on dating violence with uh, schools across the entire region. We had another one of those scheduled for next month, February, but we've had to postpone it until spring. So in May, we will hopefully the surge will be over and we'll be able to um, reinstitute that that region wide conference of hundreds of kids. Uh, and we are now using Amanda form we had to pivot and utilize college students as our leadership team, you know, our, our young adult leadership team because uh, it was really hard to get teenagers out of high school and you know with the pandemic and all that sort of thing even volunteers weren't allowed to come in so that has been a great move i think we are uh, rolling more into the college campuses and it's 16 to 24 year olds are the most impacted by dating violence and domestic violence so it makes a lot of sense you know our college kids and working with our our youth um, but what we have seen over the past year is just a huge increase in children in shelter um, with their parent, primarily women and children, but we also can serve, you know, all, all demographics. We've had men, you know, we've had elderly, we've had LGBTQ+, you know, we, our new campus is accessible to all of, you know, a broad range of demographic, but in domestic violence situations, the hardest, it's the hardest for women with children to leave. You know, it, what keeps that you had asked, what keeps them right. there? You know, what keeps right. them why there? Is it, why is it so difficult for women to get out of those situations? It, right, and prime, for women with children, it's incredibly difficult because oftentimes, they don't even have a bank account sometimes, you know, and then you've got your children. So you're, why does anybody stay in an unhappy marriage, right? You know, even it, whether or not it's a, a, it's an abusive situation, people stay because you worry about your children, you're going to change their entire lifestyle, where are you going to live? And in an abusive situation, there's so much danger going to live with a friend or, or with a family member. So that's why domestic violence shelters are so incredibly important because it can de-escalate the family violence by getting people out of that crisis situation into a neutral location. You know, and that, then you're not endangering other friends or other family because that's one hold you know, that is utilized to keep people in an unhealthy situation. So, yeah, I remember uh, when I was practicing law, I did a lot of family law and I knew that um, that was the most dangerous time when, when um, a husband was going to be served with a petition for dissolution. Um, that like 24 hour period after that was the most dangerous time for women. Uh, it, it and very so, much is. Yeah, we really had to make sure that she was in a safe place and uh, she was uh, protected uh, during that time. So, uh, and, you know, so fear of that, situation, you know, fear of upsetting a partner so much that they, you know, might be violent. Um, I'm sure it keeps women from, you know, from pursuing any separation. Absolutely. So, and then yeah. with children as well, you know, it's, a, it's just a lot harder logistically to get a family of four, you know, out and to get transportation and to get everybody packed up and do that in such a way that you're not tipping off the abuser. You know, so you get them out. We get people in the middle of the night with just the clothes on their back. And in one night over the holidays, we had nine people in one evening representing four different family units, um, four adults and five children. You know, mm -hmm. and we are, we're a 24 hour shelter. We provide everything free. You know, and, and if they can get to us, we'll take them in. But, but we are full, <laughs> you know, we are full. And so my point is that if 
if women with children are getting out at these higher rates and we're seeing many more children, it just tells you how escalated the violence is becoming because, you know, it's, it, they'll stay longer than anybody else generally. Right. And so um, how much a, a difference have you seen during the pandemic in the a number of difference. women? I mean, I've looked back over the data from four or five years worth of data, and we are serving more domestic violence uh, survivors now this year, the last few months than we have in, in years, you know, all the data that I can see. I mean, six times as many as we had several years ago. So uh, we, we just have so many people needing help. And we have 12 bedrooms. And, and, how, long and can, um, how long can families stay at your facility? As long as it takes. I, we don't say, hey, you know, your time's up. You've got to leave. Uh, the goal is to empower people to move forward in healthy ways. So our advocates do an amazing job connecting people to resources. And, you know, we have even purchased plane tickets and have flown people you know, out of the area back to a support network, you know, because oftentimes um, survivors of abuse have been isolated from family. Right. And, and that's, pretty, that's pretty key, isn't it? That's typical. I mean, that, um, typical. that that's part of the, I don't know, the cycle is to become more and more isolated, to be, you know, mm -hmm. to have your violent abuser uh, remove you from your support systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a, a strategy that's utilized, I'd say, in pretty much every, every case I've ever seen, you know. And what we're seeing during the pandemic is that people are staying with us longer because there's nowhere to go, you know, and, and, and housing, transitional housing, you know, affordable housing, all of those things roll into an ability of someone to get out of that situation. Because if there's nowhere else to go, they cannot find an apartment that they can afford, you know, they're likely to go back. And the average is seven times someone will wow. try to leave and go back. So, wow. So, um, uh, tell me, you know, if there, you know, how can we fix this? Um, what, you know, what's your, what is your wish to change this situation? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I have so many wishes. That's a big, big question. But, you know, our, our two main goals, let's focus on our mission. So our main goal is number one, to provide emergency crisis intervention, you know, so the shelter, emergency crisis shelter. So we need the space, we need the funding to staff 24 hour emergency shelter. Okay. And the more people we have coming in, the more staff we need, because it's not safe to have one person there and 50 people. In shelter, you know, we need we need. There are lots of medical considerations, all you know, and of course the um, abuser alerts and that sort of stuff. So, so that's one end. You know, my wish is that we continue to get the support and more local support to be able to provide all of those services. You know, as you know, staffing anything right now is costing far, far more than ever before, and we can't just close our doors if we don't have staff. You know, we can't just raise our prices, you know, to offset what we have to pay staff or a nonprofit. So, so that is the funding is huge. You know, we, we need money and, and we need that support. Secondly, we have got to increase our upstream prevention. Okay. We're not satisfied just providing the intervention. We want to go upstream, figure out what's going wrong and how we can impact that positively to circumvent that violence in the first place, right? So we've got to do the upstream prevention that requires more programming and more um, staffing and more partnerships. And we're really excited about some partnerships that we've formed um, already with you know, Ivy Tech and, and um, doing our Amanda Forum programming and, and getting out there and educating um, emergency room personnel and police officers. We helped form a Porter County uh, strangulation response team for the first time in history. LaPorte has had a strangulation response team. Um, Lake County has had a strangulation response team and now Porter County does. We spearheaded it's, that effort. Explain that, I'm not sure what that is. Okay, a strangulation response team, We the state was offering um, training for that, but you had to put together a, a collaborative group. So we, pulled in the Porter County Sheriff's Department and the Porter County 
um, attorney's office and Northwest Health. We have a stain uh, sexual assault nurse examiner uh, coordinator on our, on our team. And then three of our staff members, our advocates and our director of client services. Strangulation is the go-to when, you know, when violence against women, uh, strangulation is a key component of that. And it's a huge red flag for sexual assault, um, domestic violence, because it's used so often. So the strangulation response team trained this team who is then meeting, in fact, I think they're meeting next uh, week here at our advocacy center to start talking and training law enforcement, medical personnel to see these red flags of strangulation so that these people who are experiencing that can get more help. You know, it, it's a tricky thing. It's, it's hard to um, identify sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's why that's important, the strangulation response team. And, and we're going to uh, meet quarterly to try and get that word out and get that education out around the county. Well, that is interesting. I mean, I didn't mm -hmm. know that as a, you know, mm -hmm. that that is uh, always kind of a, an element of uh, domestic violence. So it, not always, but mm -hmm. it often is. And we see it here often. Um, and and so, if you would think about the health, the ongoing health problems caused by that kind of continuous abuse, you know, you're talking about your neck, your head, but you know that it's such a um, sensitive area and then the health problems that are exacerbated by that when it's an ongoing attack strategy, they're huge. So the, so the, the hope is to identify women who are suffering from this kind of abuse uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are there certain signs? I mean, just are you just looking for physical marks? It was a very long training. It was um, a month long of full day Fridays of training for our strangulation response team. I personally did not attend, but, but the strangulation response team, our advocates and, and the law enforcement, they were taught, uh, they were taught all of those signs to go on out into the community and spread that word. Interesting. You know, so deaths in Indiana from domestic violence uh -huh. uh, have risen. So from July 1st of 2020 through June 30th of 2021, ICADV recorded 98 deaths, domestic violence deaths attributed to domestic violence. And that's 181% more than the year before. And those are just the ones that were, you know, found to be attributed to domestic violence. And in cases such as strangulation, so many other things, sometimes they're not even, you know, there are far more deaths that are domestic violence that aren't actually attributed to domestic violence. Right. So almost double. Oh, yeah. Almost yeah. double from the year before. In one That's year. Mm -hmm. Wow. And were, were domestic violence shelters eligible for, um, you know, uh, the American Rescue Plan funding mm -hmm. uh, and the CARES Act funding? Yes. In fact, that's uh, one of the things I'm most proud of. Uh, the 2021 ARP fits the ARP funding. Mm -hmm. We wrote in a request for a children's services specialist. So we did not have um, children's advocates on staff and hadn't for years. Uh, so I wrote a two-year grant for a children's services specialist, which focused specifically on our children in shelter and their parents and partnered with SAMHSA recognized best practice in suicide prevention, substance abuse prevention, uh, violence prevention, sources of strength. So we are partnering with sources of strength to bring that curriculum into our staff, we did a, you know, a staff retreat because Sources of Strength is about, um, it's a wellness program. It's best practice, protective factors focused on hope, help, and strength, okay, for, for everybody, adults, children. Uh, and then we're using that with our children and their parents to teach those healthier habits, um, you know, developing hope, developing strengths. It's strength-based. Uh-huh. Wow. Well, that's really great. And so I assume that you were considered essential workers and were eligible for the PPP, the payroll protection plan mm -hmm. funding. So, mm -hmm. well, that's excellent. That's excellent mm -hmm. that you were in that. And, um, and so you'll be getting some new funds from the new ARP uh, uh, grants. 
We Any hope so. None of that's a given. I we see. just submitted um, a grant for that. And I'm glad you bring that up. Uh, so our fingers are crossed that we'll get some 2022 specifically from the ICJI portion of that. Um, and but that's the thing the about all these state Indiana grants, Criminal Justice Institute, you, you do a yes. lot of, you do a lot of Indiana activity, Criminal so like Justice this. Institute. Yes. Yeah. Um, there it's alphabet soup around here. I'm just, a, <laughs> there's so many, yeah. uh, that was a big eye opener when I came in the first year. Um, but what people I think don't realize about small nonprofits like us, like the caring place is that we have no local government funding. We are not affiliated with uh, DCS and funded by that or um, the Department of Children's Services or anything like that. So we don't get any baseline funding from anywhere. Uh, we earn every single penny through writing some grants through um, you know, ICJI, Indiana Criminal Justice Institute. And that's about if we get them, so we're not guaranteed those. If we get them, that's about 25 to 30% of our budget, okay? That money is reimbursement based. So in order to even apply for those grants, you have to have the cash flow to be able to pay for your staff, you know, your staffing and all of those things prior to getting reimbursed, which could be six months even sometimes or, or longer. So that is one piece of our funding, but everything else that we get is through private donors and, and local foundations and um, you know corporate sponsors who well, support and the us. amount of work and time that that takes to exactly you know, raise funds is and we're yeah. a very small staff yeah. you know so we all wear a lot of hats and and uh, are working a lot of hours <laughs> bringing in that funding is there funding available through HUD? housing and urban development i mean you know this is you know to, to some extent a real housing issue it is a housing issue but um we don't mission creep <laughs> into that you know that housing area our mission is domestic violence but we do partner with uh say housing opportunities and and work with them and sometimes they channel some of that our way when they can um mm -hmm. medical uh, partnerships, HealthLink has been incredible. I don't know what we would have done without, or what we would do right now without HealthLink, um, because they, you know, make sure we get tests and they make sure that we have access to vaccinations and and you know if we have medical issues, which we often do with residents due to the yeah. nature of why they're with us, um, you know, we go to HealthLink. They're fantastic. Wow. And so, um, you know, I know here in Laporte County, um, a nonprofit, the Stepping Stone, um, does you know the same work, and they were able many years ago now to um, build a longer-term traditional housing facility uh -huh. uh, where people can stay up to two years, uh -huh. um, and uh, and I think that has been you know just enormously helpful um, for women to you know not have to you know go right out there. Um, uh -huh. you know, and I know you say they can stay as long as they need to, um, uh -huh. but I can't, um, but I assume that the two years is too long. Right. Right. <laughs> right. That's yeah. the, because we are an emergency crisis center. So mm -hmm. we are working to remove people from the peak of the lethality. Okay. Right. And then empower them to be able to move forward and, and transition or get out of the area, you know, find a a new job, move to their own apartment, that sort of thing. And how long, I mean, what's the average length of this day? The average is about 30 days. Yeah. It's about 30 days, but some, mm -hmm. you know, some will come in and leave right away the next day. Um, some will be here six months, nine months. Oh, wow. You know, it, it just depends. So, yeah. I mean, I would think particularly with kids, it would take a long time to, you know, establish credit, to get a job, to find childcare, all Absolutely. of those things. And um, our advocates do a wonderful job of linking them to those resources, but you can only link them to what's available. So, you know, if there aren't apartments available, it, it, it's pretty difficult. So all of these different social issues and public health issues are all intertwined. You know, the two biggest problems in Porter County for law enforcement are drugs and domestic violence. You know, so if we want to create a better um, culture and climate in Porter County, we have to address those two big issues, you know, drugs and domestic violence. Um, 
it, it, they're just all intertwined. And that's why these, that's why we work to form so many different partnerships across nonprofits. I'm a real collaborator. I feel we're a lot stronger together. So working with, you know, family focus who comes in and provides therapists for our clients and, you know, working with DCS and we provide that avenue for people to come in and meet with their attorneys and, and, you know, talking to the different housing um, um, activists, you know, who are, are building housing and affordable housing and all of those sorts of things are intertwined. They are. Everything is, uh, everything is connected, isn't it? It is. So. It is. Which is why upstream prevention is so important in getting out there and teaching healthy, healthy relationships and, and taking away the stigma of seeking help. You know, why do people stay? Why don't people talk about it? Because of the stigma. You know, survivors of domestic violence in a survey, um, a statewide survey that was done just a couple of years ago, said that they really feel um, they can't win because they get judged for staying, they get judged for leaving, you know, and there's just the, the stigma is intense. So people don't talk about it. Man, oh, this is just, yeah, this is a, one of the toughest, toughest issues out there. Um, and yeah, and I'm, and I'm sure okay. it's just uh, really just um, so difficult to watch um, women and children, families, you know, who get away and then end up going back. Um, you know, and you can see why. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, reasons. I mean, you know, I mean, just the lack of resources, you know, the lack of a car, the lack of a job, mm -hmm. the lack of childcare, the lack of housing, mm -hmm. you know, it's overwhelming. I'm sure it's just overwhelming for women trying to get out of that situation. It is, and there are so many barriers stacked up against them. It's, you know, when made, I don't know if you read the book Made or saw the series made, yeah. but I have to tell you, after that came out, we had many more calls and we had some, some new donors because they said, I never realized, you know, just how difficult it was for somebody to get out of a situation like that. And you take two steps ahead and then you get knocked back down, you know, 10 steps. And the system is just so difficult to maneuver. Um, you know, you have to have a job to get the childcare, but you can't get childcare because you don't have the job and, you know, all of those things. And that's very real. It, that is truly, absolutely what our people face every day. Wow. And so, um, is there, uh, any work going on as far as prosecution of, uh, you know, domestic violence offenders? Sure. Um, we are advocates, um, have done a huge number of protective orders over the past year. So protective orders and um, lots of assistance with um, child custody and those sorts of things. Um, we work really closely with the Porter County Sheriff's Department and the Valparaiso Police Department, you know, who just hired a social worker, which is great news. Uh, we work really closely with them and, it, and it's intertwined. You know, oftentimes we'll get people, the police officers who respond to these situations will transport women and children to us themselves. You know, I, I think maybe people don't realize how closely we, we work together and how grateful we are for our local uh, police departments. They do so much to help us because they know how badly we're needed. <laughs> in a community, you know. If we can provide a safe space for people, it makes every other part of the community safer. You know, if, if domestic violence doesn't stay contained, you know, to just that family, it, it oozes out. You know, um, we had Annie Nicholson who was killed years ago uh, in the grocery store parking lot by an ex-husband. And, you know, her brother is now on our, on our board, uh, mm -hmm. I think. Nice. I think it's such a difficult topic. It's, I often tell my, my staff, you know, we're just not a warm, fuzzy no. <laughs> um, nonprofit. You know, we can't put pictures of our kids out there if we could, you know, but we can't do that. It's a private thing. And so we're not warm, fuzzy in that way because it's an issue that hits home for so many people. The vast majority of us have some some have been impacted by domestic violence in some way, you know, whether it's an aunt 
or you know a past dating relationship that you had or it's a neighbor or it's the your child's friend you know and his family if you really talk to people and you really stop to think about it pretty much everybody has some story you know has been impacted in some way by domestic violence situations yeah, this is, um, this is just, it's just so hard. And so, um, and I know that in cases where uh, the woman is dependent financially on their domestic partner, um, mm -hmm. they often oppose having that partner arrested and put in jail, because that will interfere with the financial sustainability of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, then you've got someone who's, you know, doing this and not there's no consequences. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a really sticky situation in so many ways because in that same survey I mentioned before of survivors of domestic violence, one of the things they said that they needed most, you know, besides the less stigma, you know, less judgment from the rest of society was more assistance for the abuser and their spouses, you know, or, or intimate partners that they, they feel there's a great need for more help for the abuser as well. And what, and any idea of like what that means, what kind of help are we talking about? So we're talking, I guess we're talking about counseling and. Yeah. Yeah. Counseling. And, and oftentimes so many of the th these things again are intertwined. It's when he drinks you know, or when she drinks. And, and it's really important to remember that this is not just a male issue. You know, this is male and female issues. There are, um, there's same sex domestic violence going on. There's, you know, women I've had from an education background, I know of multiple students, male students who were nearly killed by an abusive female partner. You know, so I think that whole demographic thing was was a big awakening for me. And I think so many people believe it's a certain type of demographic. You know, it's a certain type of person that experiences domestic violence. And I can tell you here right now that it is every demographic across all demographics and socioeconomic statuses and, and employment. You know, there are professionals who are experiencing this. There are, you know, blue collar, there are professionals. It's just every demographic that you can think of. Oh my gosh. So, okay. So tell us what um, we can do to help you. Oh, what you can do. I took some notes <laughs> on this for sure. <laughs> so I didn't want to forget. Um, so first thing, and, and you know, whether it's to the Caring Place or your local domestic violence organization, donate, <laughs> you know, we, and, and we do need things, but primarily we need money because during this time period, this pandemic time period, staffing is so much more expensive and we're locked into like two-year grants that only pay a portion of um, some staff members, you know, and that won't change for a while. So staffing costs have increased 24 hour staffing costs, you know, during a workforce time period where it's hard for corporate America to hire people, it's even harder for nonprofits to hire people. We can't compete with corporate, you know, rates and pay scales, that sort of thing. Maintenance, upkeep, the sheer numbers of people we have coming and going. And remember, we provide everything, food and um, you know, and, and, and clothing and winter boots and, you know, birthday parties and all of those things, you know, we provide all of that stuff. So when those things get more expensive in the economy, it's costing us more as well. Um, learn, uh, start talking. You know, that's why last year our theme was let's start talking. And we went around and facilitated conversations like this about domestic violence and sexual assault and healthy relationships and, and all of those things. And in 2022, our theme is let's start talking, filling the gaps, because there are so many gaps in, in outreach and prevention awareness and in funding, of course. So um, start talking and learning about this issue. So if you're still listening to us, 
thank you. <laughs> and then spread the word um, among your, your village. You know, each of you can help this issue by spreading the word and helping educate your own small village of human beings. Um, talk about healthy relationship skills with your kids, you know, with your, your friends. Um, it's not okay to just say, hey, don't date that guy. That There's red flags, you know, that, that's bad news. How do you create a healthy relationship? We all need to start talking about that. What do you deserve? What, what does a healthy relationship look like? Um, and encourage help seeking and don't judge. You know, um, no one's going to open up to you or ask for help or be honest with you if they feel judged. So, you know, encourage people to seek help and don't judge their motivations because if you were in that situation, you might be doing the same thing. Yes. Very difficult to, to second guess those decisions. It yeah. really is. Even yeah. though you want to, you know, I mean, I know everyone is tempted yeah. to say, why would you go back? <laughs> but oh, there's lots of, lots of very legitimate reasons. Very legitimate and, and socioeconomic reasons. And, you right. know, when children are involved, it just complicates everything that much more. And when you have no family support, you know, if the family culture has been that women are to be submissive or, you know, subjugated, that that's something, how do you break away from that if you don't have even family support for getting out of that situation? Right. And, you know, I have known women who have uh, been in abusive relationships and have gotten out, um, but years later are still being, you know, kind of yanked around um, through financial kind of abuse. Uh, and so it's really, it's really uh, upsetting that after, you know, this woman left, you know, took the kids, found a place, got the divorce, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and ended up, you know, probably not doing as well as she could have financially through mm -hmm. the divorce just to get out. Uh, mm -hmm. Because that's often, you know, I knew that when I was practicing family law, I did a lot of divorce, I had to tell women that, um, that uh, oftentimes men uh, see the children like custody, visitation, all of that as just one more item in the marital asset, um, you know, where women see that as, oh, no, no, that's separate, right, <laughs> that's separate from the, the, you know, the property and the house and all of that. And, um, and so you have to get your, you know, you, ha you have to get your head around how other people see it. Uh, and uh, often children are used in the divorce to, uh, to entice the uh, woman to give up other financial uh, property, things like that. Um, and that's just really frustrating. But yeah, uh, and even someone who goes through all that gives up some financial security uh, just to get out and to bring the kids because she's worried about the safety of the kids. Right. Um, and then years later is still um, being, you know, just yanked around by, you know, someone, you know, they have convinced to, uh, you know, I, you know, no, you keep the house and I'll pay the mortgage for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, then what happens, you know, then you're, you're constantly monthly wondering if the mortgage got paid and if it doesn't, what, you know, you're the, you're the one who's going to suffer. So, um, so it's really, um, yeah, it can, it can just be a, a lifelong struggle um, for some women. And so it is. Uh, and there are women, you know, who have lived in a situation like that for decades and have never had their own bank account. Right. So how do you separate and create a credit history? Uh, you know, there are banks that won't even let them open a a bank account, even when they escape, because there's just nothing we, you know, I have to say, uh, send here bank is works with us partners with us in ways to help women like that, you know, we know that we can call them if we have a situation like that, and they'll work with us to try and find a way to help that woman create that bank account and, and, and that sort of thing. So right, yeah, the implications, I mean, they're just endless. I mean, you can't get a credit card, Right. Or you, you can't get utilities turned on in your name. And how do you run an apartment then? Yeah, right. You can't, so, you know, you have to have, they do credit checks for everything. How do you buy a car? How do you, right. you know, how do you rent a car? You can't rent a car either, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and that, you know, that kind of uh, disability, you know, just so cripples women. And so you can absolutely see why they end up going back many times. So, okay. So tell us more, tell us where people can 
can uh, send you money? Where should they send it? <laughs> how can they reach you and um, provide you with uh, all of the things that you need? Sure. Um, you can go to our website. So our website is www.thecaringplacenwi.org uh, or just Google us and we will come up via Google. Uh, we have a Facebook page and there's a donate button. You can do that. Uh, we also have, I, I need to share the crisis number uh, right. because someone listening right now may need some advocacy. And it's important for you to know that this crisis number that I'm going to share isn't just if you're coming to live in the shelter. You know, the vast majority of people don't ever seek shelter, but you might need some advocacy and some support for filing a, a protective order or just someone to talk to, or maybe you're already out of that situation, but you need someone to help you through those next steps. So our shelter number is 219-464-2128. And you can call there and, you know, we have community clients. So it's not just our folks in shelter that we assist. We assist hundreds of community clients as well who never actually come into shelter. So, so you can help with referrals for affordable Absolutely. attorney services, perhaps? Um, we can link them or help them find other resources. So, you know, we can help walk them through 211 or get them connected with United Way or get them connected with Porter Stark or, you know, all of those, those different um, avenues of seeking help, depending on what they need. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, and hopefully those services are, you know, useful and available and funded and um, can help women, um, you know, get away from that violence. And again, you know, men, we can take in men. We've had young men. I think oftentimes people focus on domestic violence being intimate partner violence, but that's not always it. Uh, now we have so many more um, elderly and, you know, families living in extended family situations. And I think the CDC numbers were something like one in, was it one in seven um, folks above the age of 60 living at home with extended family were facing elder abuse, you know, so, so that's a form of domestic violence. Sometimes young people are living with parents or um, in-laws and there's abuse going on in that way you know sometimes for our lgbtq community uh, that happens you know living at home but but facing abuse from family members not from an intimate partner you know so there are lots of variations so don't think that it, it only has to be intimate partner violence we help in all areas of domestic violence oh my gosh yeah i had not realized <laughs> that uh, expanded definition. Wow. That's incredible. Okay. All right. Well, our time is up, but thank you so much for um, talking with me, um, getting this out. Uh, I learned a lot and um, there's, like you say, we need to start talking more about this. We do. So. And if you want to book, uh, you know, some sort of, we can come in and we can do parenting sessions. We're going to be partnering with the uh, uh, Westchester Library. So look us up. We're going to be doing some stuff on healthy relationships, talking to your teen about relationships. So, you know, there are a lot of upbeat things. We'll be bringing in our sources of strength, you know, because we work on both ends of it, you know, the red flags, but also what do you do? What can you do? You know, how do you provide hope, help, and strength? Right. Okay. Um, Denise, one more time. Can you give your phone number? Just yes. 219-464-2128. Great, great. That's our okay. advocacy line. Okay, all right, great. So um, number one, I would say first step for women or anyone in this situation is, you know, find a support group, you know, find, find your circle of support. Uh, and, uh, and it's great that you were there to help those people. So all we're right. Working well, hard. I have a fantastic staff, fantastic board you know, wonderful volunteers. If you want to volunteer, give us a call as well. We uh, take hotline volunteers. The more volunteers we have, the more we can provide as far as groups and counseling and all of those things. That's excellent. All right, great. Well, thank you again, uh, Denise. It's just been wonderful talking with you. And, you too, um, Deb. Thank you. you know, and, you know, let's, uh, let's see if we can do something about this, huh? 
We're fighting the good fight. We are. All right. Thanks again. Take care.